Caleb, did you get nervous when I left in the last song? Okay, yeah. I'd forgotten my microphone, so I headed out, and I'm thinking, oh, Caleb's going to think he's got to preach now. But what you do, I figured out what you do. I always turn it over to Dave. Just say, Dave, you're up. That's how we work it. That's, that's his, now that he's here, when he's here, just turn it over. Dave, it's up to you. So, all right. Climbing the mountain is our theme for the year. And we ask this morning, why do we climb? Because it's there. It's just how it is. We climb because it is there. Now, <clears throat> what we noticed is there are people who don't really like that because they didn't ask to be here. Somebody else brought them here. Now, why do I have to climb? I, I don't understand. And we talked about our purpose. The purpose for being here is to glorify God. And that's our purpose. So we dare not talk about why we're here as much as meaning I didn't have any choice and I don't like it, but rather I'm here. Since I'm here, climb. The next question we need to ask is, why is the mountain here? Now, we're, we're here to glorify God. But why is it that we think of, or going to, or we've been thinking this year, about the mountain climb, meaning the difficulty? Why do we have to go through this? Well, sometimes we might think because Christianity is so difficult. It's not easy. It's not, it's not something we just do without any effort. It's difficult. There are so many challenges, so many things that get in the way, so many temptations, so many problems, not to mention the fact that the world is all around us causing us difficulty on top of what we have that we cause ourselves. And so it's just not easy. And we might be tempted to say, ourselves sometimes. Why? Why does it have to be this way? Wouldn't it be okay if we could just glide through? Well, there are some people in Scripture, many of them that we could consider, but for our purposes for a moment, think about some people who probably were candidates to ask the question, why? Probably. And these are the people to whom Peter wrote his first letter. Notice how he begins the letter. To the pilgrims of the dispersion. He's writing to people who were pilgrims. That means they didn't have a home. They were not home. They were pilgrims. And they were of the dispersion. Apparently, where they are is not where they were. And where they were, they were kicked out to be where they are. That's what sounds like it's going on. Well, who are these people? It seems to me that these are people that we can go back to Acts chapter 8 and find out about. The Bible says, and Saul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the church, entering into every house and dragging off men and women to prison. The response was that people left, the Christians, many of them, left. Jerusalem. Now, see what's going on is, prior to that, the great day of Pentecost had happened, and at least 3,000 people on that day, not to mention many others later, but 3,000 people that day obeyed the gospel, and all of these people were foreigners. 
That is, they weren't from Jerusalem. They came to Jerusalem from far away places. And when they obeyed, they didn't go home. They just stayed. Now, we don't know how long. It appears to me it might have been a time of three or four or five, six years, something along that line. And, and then all of a sudden, see, God's not wanting that. He doesn't want to just keep his word cloistered right there in Jerusalem. And so he used the persecution of Saul to spread the gospel. And I'm thinking that when Peter wrote this book, maybe 30 years after the establishment of the church, he is writing to Christian people who had been dispersed because of the persecution of Saul. It may not be right, but that's what I'm reading. And know what's going on? They're facing it again. This book is Peter talking to people under persecution. Look at chapter 4. We'll see it again in a moment. Don't think it strange, this fiery trial. His whole point for writing the letter, it seems to me, was to encourage them in the difficulty of living the Christian life. And so he needs to bolster them. He needs to pick them up. He needs to give them something that they can hold on to because apparently their whole world seemed to be falling apart. I wonder, did Peter maybe think that these were people who were being tempted to say, why us? Why me? Why do we have to go through this? We're trying to do what's right. We're trying to follow God. Why does it have to be so tough? And I wonder if that's why he wrote this letter to say, yeah, it's tough. It is. But guess what? The mountain is there. Keep climbing. You need to do this. Why? Why? Well, this morning, the theme was purpose. Our purpose for being here according to God, was to give him glory. Tonight, the word is preparation. Now, to do that, let's take a moment and think about gravity. Don't you love gravity? I didn't like gravity as much when I was trying to play basketball because I could not even jump and touch the rim. Could not. Still can't jump. Never could jump. Just not able to do it. And then some 5'7", 5'8", guy comes along. He can slam dunk a basketball. Makes me mad. But I can't jump. You know why? Gravity holds me down. For just a minute, think about gravity. Our bodies need gravity. I read some today about the work of NASA in studying men and women who go off into space and spend considerable time. And they're studying them in order to see what are the effects of time out in space where there is no gravity. Here are some things that I learned today about gravity. Number one, gravity helps us grow properly. One guy wrote, he said, gravity gives the muscles something to strain against. Growing properly. Gravity causes the muscles to have to work. 
Because it's fighting as we are growing, it is fighting the pull to come back down. And so while we grow, the tension between, come back down here and I want to go up here, makes a person grow properly. Without it, we would not grow as we should. Gravity, we have learned, is even more than that. It's about health. One of the things that they said, uh, NASA found out, in people who have spent excessive time, a lot of time, in the space station, they found that there is a correlation between gravity and health because the lack of gravity harms the membranes of what are known as T cells. And it's the T cells that help us fight disease, even sepsis. T cells fight. But in the weightless environment, they found that the membranes of these T cells become weakened, exposing people not only to diseases, but to the inability to fight the disease off. Now, whoever would have thought that gravity had anything to do with keeping us fighting diseases. I had no idea. He said that studying the weightless time, they found out that gravity makes us strong. Another thing they found in studying these astronauts was that they have been able to record as much as a 1% loss of bone mass per month in a weightless environment without proper exercise. Isn't that interesting? So gravity contributes to strong bones. Gravity is responsible for making sure that the fluids of our bodies do not rise and get trapped in the upper parts of our bodies. Now think about that. I've heard, I've been many times with people who have had surgery. And I would go visit them and one of the common themes, it doesn't matter what kind of surgery it really was, but any time there was an invasion of the body, I've heard these people say, I hurt right here. Well, why are you hurting at the top of your shoulders when you had leg surgery? Well, <clears throat> there's air trapped in there. And it's rising to the top. Just imagine if every one of our bodily fluids, including the blood, would pool north of us, pushing up. In fact, they found in a weightless environment that it, the blood does that. And it damages, it puts pressure on the brain. And you know what happens? <clears throat> With pressure on the brain, you can't think very well. So gravity helps us think better. Who would have thought that? I didn't. And finally I found the one that we all understand. Gravity keeps us grounded. We don't have to be concerned that we're going to take a step and jump and then just keep on going. There might be times when we would like to be able to do that. Wouldn't it be great? You're in the back of the line and you could just jump to the front of the line. Wouldn't that be really good? But then everybody else would be jumping too, so you'd still have a clog in the air, not just on the ground. But the point is, gravity keeps us grounded. 
So those are at least five things that I learned today that gravity does for the physical body. So let me propose this. The journey. The climb. It's difficulty. It's uneasiness is to the spiritual body what gravity is to the physical body. So that the struggles of this life, the struggle of the climb of the Christian life is God's spiritual gravity for us because we need it. For instance, as physical gravity helps the physical body to grow properly, so too does God's spiritual gravity help us grow spiritually. Now, if you're following along on the outline, you're going to have to flip points one and two verse wise. I decided to change it. It helps us to grow properly. Do you recall Hebrews chapter 12? The writer is talking about the chastening and disciplining of the Lord. And he uses, starting in verse number 7, he uses this, or actually back in verse um, 5 or 3, he uses this comparison. And he says, We all had human fathers who corrected us according to their own will. In other words, we've all been disciplined by parents. And he says, this discipline, this chastening was not easy. Any of us who were ever disciplined with the belt of discipline, the spatula of discipline, The thump of discipline on the head. I used to get that one. I didn't like it because it sounded so hollow. You know, I didn't like it. But the point is, any of us who have had that, we didn't like it. But what does he say? If you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? Obviously, he's talking about good fathers. Indeed, verse 10, for a few days they chastened us as seemed best to them. But he noticed for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening. Seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. The toughness of the climb trains us to grow properly. God's gravity is the pull of the difficulties of the climb to give us a training by which we grow properly. Number two, God's gravity, like physical gravity, is necessary to keep us healthy. Jesus said in John 15 in verse 2, Every branch in me that bears fruit, my Father prunes, that it may bear more fruit. What's he saying? The health of the tree. 
You know what it's like to prune something in your yard, some plants, and, and when you first prune it, you go, ooh, that just doesn't look good. What happened? I think I messed up. But not too long, you get this healthy, well manicured, this obviously healthy plant because of the pruning. God is involved in making us spiritually healthy. When he uses his discipline and his chastening to make us healthy. Now, before I go any farther, don't ask me. Tell me all the ways that God disciplines because I don't know. I still know. But what I am going to say is this. Everything that's going on that came into this world because of sin coming here, every bit of it, is not what he wanted for our training. I think what he wanted was to be trained in the garden. Did you notice that in the garden, everything was exactly right for spiritual development? Everything was exactly what we needed. But when sin came into the world, everything began to be corrupted. And now, he's using that. That wasn't his intention. But because it is here, he now is using it for our health. So am I supposed to say that every time I get sick, God said, no, nah, you need to be healthy, so I'm going to make you sick? No. But what I can say is that every time I go through a difficulty in life, no matter what it is, I can look at it and say, if I handle this right, I will be healthier as a Christian if I handle it well. Number three, God's gravity, his pressure upon us from sources outside of us makes us stronger. When Peter wrote the passage that I referred to a little bit earlier, when Peter wrote to encourage the people to whom he was writing, we begin in verse 12 of chapter 4, 1 Peter. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened to you. In other words, this is not out of the ordinary. This is not something that you should think should not be here. In fact, it's here. And yes, you have to deal with it. In other words... It's there. It's there. Keep climbing. But rejoice. To the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. For if you are reproached for the name of Christ... Blessed are you, for the spirit of glory of God rests upon you. On their part he is blasphemed, but on your part he is glorified. Particularly to these people suffering persecution, he was saying, this is going to strengthen you. Because you will, by going through it, be able to say, Jesus went through it. He was persecuted, and therefore I'm being persecuted. It gives me strength to say, I'm just like, I'm being like my Lord, and that's okay. That's what we want to be anyway, right? But I think we can apply it to more than just persecution. Didn't Jesus face disappointment? I think he did. Didn't, don't you think Jesus faced betrayal? I think he did. Was he ever sad? Sure. Could he, could he feel the sicknesses and diseases of others that he needed to cure? Absolutely. 
Therefore, it applies to in the same way this persecution did to say, as gravity makes you stronger, then if we're faced with God's gravity working through the difficulties of life, we can come out on the other side stronger than we went in. God's gravity helps us think properly. Just like gravity makes the brain work better by keeping the fluids where they're supposed to be without adding pressure, God's gravity can do the same thing with thinking properly. Notice the little statement that Paul said to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 and in verse 12, when he said, Yes, those who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. You see, if I'm thinking properly, then I want to live godly. That's proper thinking. I want to live godly. I want to be better. I want to grow. I want to. You add whatever you want. But when you're thinking properly, you're going to suffer. You're going to have problems. But thinking properly is what will get us through those difficulties, knowing that we can win with Jesus. That's what Paul was telling Timothy. But finally, God's gravity keeps us grounded. Did you catch the words of the text from 1 Peter 1 that was just read? Check these words. The genuineness of your faith. Why were these people going through these various trials? For the testing of the genuineness of your faith. It's more precious than gold. Notice, it is tested by fire, verse 7. Grounded because you're being tested. So that you can be found to praise and honor and glory. Discovered, found, standing, planted. You rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Notice, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul, grounded. Not a one of us here wants to miss heaven. Not a one of us here wants to fail spiritually. And so he's telling these people, going through what appears to be the extreme difficulties of life that probably none of us have faced. But we've faced enough challenges. We've faced enough trouble that we can say once we get through it that it made us a better and more well-rounded and grounded individual. Because now, my faith has been tested. And I got through it. And now I know what the end of my faith is going to be because I've survived the difficulties. So let me suggest, we climb the mountain because the mountain represents God's proving ground for our eternal existence. That's what it is. That's how he proves us. 
And it seems to me in Scripture, and we could talk about this in, in various ways, but it seems to me in Scripture that, that God is often, since we think of God properly, as I said, we talked about in class this morning, God is omniscient. He knows. There are so many times in Scripture that it, it sounds like God is, is doing something, testing to see, to find out something. He doesn't know, so he's going to find out. Well, I, I'm not there. Abraham, go sacrifice your son. It's not my belief that God didn't know what Abraham's heart was. He didn't know what his reaction was going to be. So the testing was not so God could find out, but so that Abram could find out. That's what I think. And I think those times when it appears that God is doing something to, to find out something that he doesn't know, it seems more likely to me that he's doing something to help the people find out for themselves what they do not know. And that's what he's doing for us. He's proving. He's testing. And he's revealing us to us. And we need it, don't we? Don't we want to know? Don't we want to have the impurities burned out? Don't we want to have the holes plugged? Don't we want to have the structure strengthened? I think we do. But the way we do it here is the climb. It's here. Can't get around it. Let's keep climbing. Because that's how we prove ourselves to ourselves. And God's working with us. Let's just keep climbing, people. No matter how difficult it is, let's keep climbing. If you're ready to be with the Lord, putting Him on in baptism, to be in His family, we're ready to help you do it. You'll get to meet another one whom we baptized today after our morning assembly. In fact, it was one of the first times in a long time when this person sat down in my office and began to cry, I'm ready to do this. And I was going to put her off for a while. Let me study with you for a little bit. Wait a minute. And she said, I, these were her words, I've had my nose in the book. And I know what I'm doing. And I want to be right. And I said, deal, no problem. You want to do it now? Well, yes, that's how it was. If you're ready for that, we're ready too. Or if you're ready and need our help in some other way, we stand and sing for your encouragement. Let's stand together. <laughs>